Thanks everyone for coming. First I want to point out that it would be wrong to think that Tony Abbott is going to do nothing about climate change. I think his government wants to do three things at least. Uh, those three things are deny, delay and deregulate. They're going to deny the problem and Tony Abbott is on record in the past saying that climate change is absolute crap but more recently uh, he's, he's put forward another kind of denial saying that it, the jury is still out about how big a contribution humankind is, is making to climate change. Um, the delay is the, is the consensus position actually among the two big parties, delay the rapid transition away from fossil fuel use, which is so embedded in our society, away from the fossil fuel economy, and deregulate. And what Tony Abbott will do is speed up um, the fossil fuel juggernaut in this country. Um, that is the, those, those three things, oh, he, will, he will remove even the, the insufficient um, uh, uh, climate policies which the Labor Party had. So those are the three things which, which Abbott intends to do. I think fighting his government's plans in the meantime, well, it's, it's, fairly, it's fairly straightforward, at least in, in, the, in the abstract. Um, of course, we need to rebuild the climate movement, a movement which was demobilised and suffered greatly over the past few years. And I put that down to the policy train wreck that was the carbon price. Plus, we also need to throw our support be behind all those grassroots movements that aim to keep fossil fuels in the ground, uh, rein in Australia's coal and gas export boom. It is an explosion. Um, which has been planned, a doubling of coal exports, a massive explosion of, of unconventional gas from coal seam gas um, to be exported around the world. And um, also to halt the road building madness as protesters are doing right now in Melbourne with the protests against the east-west tunnel and also get renewable energy and public transport built. That's just some of, of, the, of the things we need to do. Um, but today I'm not going to focus so much about the mechanics of how we draw together such a movement. Instead I want to focus on partly the reasons we're in such a mess and why any successful bid to deal with climate change will have to confront and eventually remake the whole system. I want to start however with a bit of a, a, an anecdote about a hearing which took place earlier this year in British Columbia, a state of Canada. And at this hearing, um, a witness called by the Canadian firm Entbridge, uh, a firm which wants to build a $6.5 billion pipeline linking the Canadian tar sands to the Pacific coast. And this is a hearing into that project. And the representative of Entbridge, a, a very big oil company, um, made the argument that oil spills actually make good economic sense. Now, he said oil spills can benefit the economy because it gives business new opportunities to make money from cleaning it up. He also told Fishers Union representatives that an oil spill in British Columbia may indeed kill the fishing industry, but that their lost income would be replaced by compensation payouts and new career prospects, such as, he said, working for oil spill cleanup crews. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that's not fair. How come communities in British Columbia get to reap all the economic gains of an oil spill disaster? <laughs> Why do we have to live in safety if it's all so good? But it's, it's easy to laugh at the kind of argument, at that kind of thinking, um, to write it off as a, as a desperate ploy by a greedy oil company. The argument assumes, just to, to go through some of the assumptions, the argument assumes it could be more useful to allow an oil spill than prevent it from happening. It assumes the ecological, the social, the health, the emotional costs of such a disaster can be calculated in financial terms and neatly balanced off with a cash payment. It suggests that there's no fundamental economic difference between activity that preserves or destroys natural uh, human lives and natural ecosystems. It says the short-term financial uh, gains from causing pollution can count for more than maintaining the integrity of the biosphere for, 
the indefinite future. It accepts that ruining the natural world helps provide generous new opportunities to expand capital. So before we laugh too hard, I think we should recognise that all of the world's big corporations make all of these assumptions, which I've just listed, on a day-to-day -day basis as part of their business model. The argument put to the hearing in, in Canada was cruder than most, but it's entirely consistent with the inner logic and the everyday practice of, of the capitalist system. And the British German economist E.F. Schumacher, some of you may be familiar with Schumacher, he wrote the book a long fair while ago called Small is Beautiful. But in that book he said this, the strength of the idea of private enterprise lies in its terrifying simplicity. It suggests that the totality of life can be reduced to just one aspect, profits. It's terrifying simplicity. Now, many of you will be familiar with Rosa Luxemburg's famous dictum of socialism or barbarism, a saying, incidentally, which was first coined by Frederick Engels. Um, Luxemburg was writing about the social and political choices facing Europe in the midst of the First World War, which was a truly barbarous event, which she described it as a time where mass slaughter has become the tiresome and monotonous business of the day. Now, the saying socialism or barbarism is pretty common on the socialist left. And I must confess that in the past, I've kind of treated it as a bit of a left-wing cliche and have often had to stifle some groans when I saw another socialist try to out. So thanks to those who have really stifled the groan so far. But what I, I guess for me now, that um, in the past few years, I've become more and more aware of the extent of the planet-wide ecological breakdowns, I've changed my mind and I've decided that it might even sum up things pretty neatly, that it's very applicable to our age. A uh, hundred years ago, Luxembourg said of the phrase and rereading one of her books, that this struck me. She said, until now, we have all re probably read and repeated these words, socialism or barbarism, repeated these words thoughtlessly without suspecting their fearsome seriousness. And that was true of me. Continuing down, our path, the current path, will have fearsomely serious consequences. Indeed, I think the catch cry for our times could be updated to, to the not so jolly, but I think apt socialism or eco-socialism or mass extinction. Well, I'm talking about mass extinction, but that's exactly where we're headed. According to a, a, a report released just a couple of weeks ago, uh, a week after the IPCC report, um, it was released by a group of world uh, leading marine scientists. And their State of the Ocean 2013 report said this, the next mass extinction event may have already begun. By mass extinction event, the scientists are referring to those very rare times in the Earth's history, just five times in the past 500 million years, where most life forms are wiped out very, very, very quickly. So you'd be most familiar with the mass extinction event that caused the end of the dinosaurs um, 66 million years ago. In that case, due to a meteorite. The fossil records show that the biggest one of these events took place 250 million years ago, known as the end Permian mass extinction. And that killed up to 95% of marine species um, at the time. Now this report said that today's high levels of carbon emissions is causing what they termed a deadly trio of effects. This deadly, this trio is one, ocean acidification, two, ocean warming, and three, deoxygenation, that is growing, uh, sorry, declining oxygen in, in the ocean. Now, acidification is a sign that the increase in CO2 is surpassing the capacity of the ocean to absorb it. Now, oceans are a natural carbon sink. They always um, draw down carbon, always have. But too much carbon has been dissolved into it, leading to an excess of carbon acid, carbonic acid. Um, the ocean is becoming more acid and less alkaline. So we're talking not, not the kind of acid that Walter White in Breaking Bad uses to get rid of the bodies, but 
the acid, the same acid which I've been watching, watched too much of that show. Uh, the acid, the acid you'll find in, in a can of fizzy soft drink. Um, the report said that the ocean is more acid today than any time in the past 300 million years. That's the, that's the result, consequence of the human burning of fossil fuels for the past couple of centuries. Now the increase, increasing acidification spells doom, for instance, for the world's coral reefs. They cannot survive. It also means the end, if it continues, um, for other creatures that form their shells from calcium carbonate, such as crustaceans, um, many plankton as well. Now, ocean warming is the second part of this deadly trio. Average ocean temperatures have risen by 0.6 of a degree in the past 100 years. Now, that doesn't seem like much, but the ocean is a far more delicate, um, uh, delicately balanced ecosystem than we perhaps realised until recently. Now, as the ocean gets warmer, it will help trigger critical climate tipping points that will warm the entire planet even faster, hurtling it far beyond the climate in which today's life has evolved. For instance, it will accelerate the ongoing death spiral, not my words, but words of, um, of uh, Arctic scientists, the death spiral of the polar sea ice. And will also risk, a warming, warming ocean risks the release of huge amounts of greenhouse gases, methane, uh, frozen um, at the bottom of the, of the sea in the Arctic and also in the permanently frozen soils which are now beginning to thaw. Um, uh, a potential uh, store of carbon twice as large as that which humans have put into the atmosphere in the past couple of hundred years. Double what w the damage we've done um, could be released in, in a, if the ocean continues to warm. Now, ongoing ocean warming will also wreak havoc on marine life as well. Um, the report projects, quote, the loss of 60% of present biodiversity of exploded marine life and invertebrates, including numerous local extinctions, end quote. Now, the third prong of the deadly trio, deoxygenation, the, the decline of oxygen in the water, is, is related both to the warming of the oceans, but also it's related to the nutrient runoff um, into the ocean, particularly from agriculture, from use of fertilisers. Um, you'd be familiar perhaps with uh, uh, low oxygen dead zones because that's where algal blooms grow. Um, but very few other cre sea creatures can survive. The report says overall oxygen levels, uh, which have actually declined cons quite consistently for the past 50 years, um, could fall by up to 7% by the end of the century. Doesn't seem, that percentage doesn't seem that much, but it will make a huge difference. Plus, there's also been a big rise in zero or low, very, very low oxygen dead zones. And these zones have doubled every decade since the 1960s. It's quite frightening exponential growth in the dead zones in the ocean. So what is the take-home conclusion from this deadly trio? Now the report said, quote, most if not all of the Earth's past five mass extinctions have involved at least one of these three main symptoms, all of which are present in the ocean today. So that is why these scientists are so, so worried, because we have all three happening at the same time. All three happening at the same time as other things which are weakening the ocean, such as chemical pollution and overfishing, are, are creating the, the, a perfect storm. Uh, the greatest biggest thing on this planet, the ocean, is, is under threat. And we depend a lot more on the ocean, we depend a lot more on the bacteria in the ocean than it depends on us. So this is also a huge threat to all of us. So knowing this, and with the Tony Abbott government steeped in climate change denial, and with big business investing billions around the globe to extract ever more coal, oil and gas, a huge boom in unconventional gas, in unconventional oil extraction, is going on. Billions are being invested in that at this time. I think we could also update Luxembourg again to rewrite that quote of hers I mentioned earlier and conclude that mass extinction has also become the tiresome and monotonous business of our day. Now considering the gravity of the climate crisis, it is maddening. Maddening to think of how easy it would be, relatively easy it would be to take serious action. 
We need about, for instance, for example, we'd need about 4 million wind turbines around the world to eradicate coal burning for energy. So to replace, you know, 40% of the world's energy comes from burning coal, the most polluting fossil fuel. Now, 4 million seems like a huge, almost insurmountable challenge. But it's not too hard a task when you consider this, that the car industry alone, working at just two thirds of its manufacturing capacity, made 65 million cars in 2008. So that is just the unused manufacturing capacity in this single industry will be enough to build all those wind turbines. Certainly they could do it in a decade. If you consider the unused manufacturing capacity around the glo globally, some studies have indicated in the US, for example, it's about 20%. Even just the unused capacity, let alone an economy-wide drive, we could do this transition. Um, the capacity is there. Now, two years ago, the environmental consultants group called EcoFist produced a report and they said, what would it take for the whole world to shift to 100% renewable energy? So, all, end all burning of fossil fuels. And their study said it could be done. They chose to study it for over a 40 year period. They said it would cost about 3% of world GDP a year, so not, not cheap at all but it would end up paying a very big social dividend. Um, they estimated it would be $5.7 trillion every year of savings, money which was no longer spent on fossil fuels uh, by mid-century, $5.7 trillion. So along with the climate benefits, spending big on a rollout of renewable energy would save money. Um, after upfront investment, it would save a lot of money. This is money which would otherwise go into the hands of fossil fuel companies and the banks that fund them. And that is why it is every oil, uh, oil, coal and gas company's business plan to make sure that never, ever, ever happens. Or at least that, it, that, that time is delayed as long as possible. That is, is why. So Big Capital has responded to the climate crisis by moving aggressively to protect its assets. This has taken several different forms. Many employ uh, advertising companies to greenwash their, their activity. Other corporations have uh, employed what I call an eco-mergers and acquisition strategy, offering dirty money to peak environment groups who are unprincipled enough to accept and influ influencing them from the inside. Perhaps the most prominent among these responses is the move to fund and organise a political movement of climate change denial. Insofar as it promotes a willful rejection of scientific reality, climate denial is indeed deeply irrational. But as a measure to defend an irrational system, climate denial actually makes some perverse sense. It's not opposition to the science of climate change that drives deniers, but rather opposition to the fact that the science implies that we can no longer continue in the same way. The science implies we have to make deep, thoroughgoing, radical social changes. So in this sense, I think Naomi Klein is right to say that the deniers, quote, may be inconsiderably less denial than a lot of professional environmentalists. The ones who paint a picture of global warming Armageddon then assure us we can avert catastrophe by buying green products and creating clever markets in pollution. That's Naomi Klein's point. I think it's not far-fetched to say that uh, faith in pollution markets, and remember these are very strange, these are markets which trade in bads, not goods. But uh, faith in these markets rests on a different kind of denial. The dismal record of carbon trading schemes organised by the European Union, for example, which has collapsed, and also the United Nations, which is mired in a, in a decade-long crisis, those examples should alone be enough to give carbon trading's most ardent supporters reason to pause and reconsider. But the strength, the, the, the strength of, the, of this idea lies in that it offers an illusionary hope. The hope that there is a profitable solution to climate change, that avoids class conflict and social upheaval. 
that, that the illusion that we can cure capitalism's assault on nature with more capitalism. The illusion that we can deal with our alienation from all forms of natural need by making nature itself conform to the laws of the market. There are many problems with pricing nature, but I think perhaps the biggest one is that it assumes that we can solve the climate crisis with the same kind of thinking that has got us into it. Um, uh, this approach, I think, avoids the much bigger concern. An economy that, as Oscar Wilde might say, already knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. I think another common false explanation for the ecological crisis that we're in is the argument that human population size is to blame or is a major cause. In the book that we co-wrote on the topic, Ian Angus and I argued that there are not too many people on the planet, but there are too many of some people. There are too many, uh, there are too many coal barons. There are too many oil tycoons. Uh, there are too many stockbrokers speculating on food commodity prices. There are too many companies sinking coal seam gas wells around the country. So in this debate, which is a long running debate among environmentalists about what impact do population size have on environmental decay. In this debate, we took sides with the great US ecologist and socialist Barry Commoner, who said this, Pollution begins not in the family bedroom, but in the corporate boardroom. A pressing environmental problem is the 1%, it's not the 99%. The too many people argument shifts the blame for ecological destruction away from the real culprits and towards the poorest parts of the world, and that's where population is growing the fastest. And well over 90% of population growth in this century is going to happen in Africa. Um, so that in the end, the too many people argument can be uh, it, it, taken to its extreme logic, um, can be very dangerous because it ends up blaming um, or portraying uh, Africans as the biggest threat to our environment when that's the continent which has done the least um, to cause and we're the continent which will suffer the most um, as well unless we make those changes. So I think it can actually be quite a dangerous diversion from the real issues. The various green capitalist responses, the idea that capitalism itself can be made green, can be reformed, all those responses have to ignore another quite big problem. And that is that capitalism itself is a grow or die system. It needs infinitely expanding markets and an ever-growing consumption to exist. The short-term need of capitalist markets to constantly expand is at odds with the long-term cycles of regeneration required by natural ecosystems. So I think green capitalism itself is a contradiction in terms. Uh, to quote Ian Angus again, he said this, capitalism combines an irresistible drive to grow with an irresistible drive to create waste and pollution. If nothing stops it, Capitalism will expand both, both these processes infinitely. But the earth is not infinite. The atmosphere, the oceans, the forests are very large, but ultimately they are finite, limited resources. And capitalism <clears throat> is now pressing against those limits, certainly against the limit of the ocean, as we heard before. The climate crisis requires a full restructure of our economy along sustainable lines. Burning fossil fuels for energy must be rapidly phased out. Renewable energy must be put in its place. Our entire food system, which is a huge uh, source of greenhouse gases but also waste, um, must be redesigned to cut out its dependence on damaging pesticides and fertilisers and above all oil. Public transport must be made widely available in our cities. Improvements in energy efficiency must be made in all areas. A fast transition to a low carbon economy will be very far from easy, but the technical means to make that transition do exist today. We do not need any new inventions or to wait for any new breakthroughs. 
the reason we're not already on our way is that capitalism is also a system of minority rule. Economic and political power is concentrated in the hands of a very small elite who inevitably put profit before people and the planet. Um, and I fear the road towards an ecological society is closed unless decision-making power is taken away from these elites and given to the people. Political will is lacking. You often hear that, that the, if we just had the political will. And it's true. Um, political will is, is lacking among uh, politicians. But I think that's also explained by the fact that the politicians themselves are part of an economic and social system that cannot abandon short-term growth and short-term profits, even if that leads to the destruction of capitalism. Um, we live at a, at, a, at a freaky time where it's easier for people to talk about the end of civilization. They find it easier to talk about that than the end of capitalism. The ecological tyranny of the bottom line keeps real solutions from being considered, let alone carried out. Um, indifference to the environment is not a choice that capitalists make. It's not a policy error. It's not the product of mistaken economic theories. The endless pursuit of immediate gain, regardless of the long-term costs, is the way the system works. Given the extent of the ecological and, and social crises we face, I, I think the concept of eco-socialism is doubly important for all of us. Eco-socialism seeks to combine the best insights of ecology, which says that human activity can destroy the very basis of life, and combine that with Marxism's critique of capitalism, a system based on the dual exploitation of labour and nature. Eco-socialism is not a new political party or theory or organisation. It's a movement, a movement to make the Greens redder and the Reds greener. It holds in John Bellamy Foster's words, a US um, uh, uh, Marxist, that there can be no true socialist revolution that is not ecological, no true ecological revolution that is not socialist. It recognises the truth of Barry Commoner's conclusion about the ecological crisis. He said, to make peace with the planet, we must first make peace among the peoples within it. And it knows that peace is a dream as long as there are such things as lower classes, oppressed minorities and billionaire tycoons. The eco-socialist vision of change is, is grounded in grassroots democracy and full equality for all people in the world. Uh, the purpose of the economy would be to make sure that everyone had enough, not more and more, but enough for everyone. And capitalism, much of the world's population is condemned to extreme poverty and hardship, while others under the same system are constantly urged to consume more and more. The central goal of eco-socialists is to fight for a society that allows every human being to develop to their full, fullest potential, free of racism, war, poverty and discrimination. But this goal of, ge of genuine human development, which applies to current and future generations, is not achievable unless society can be transformed to exist in harmony with nature's views. Uh, that is, I think, uh, something uh, updating uh, the socialist vision which was so common in the 20th century, uh, which town tended to disregard or downplay the importance of, um, of society existing in harmony with nature's limits. But this point, I think, was made very, very well by the late Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez at the Copenhagen conference, the climate conference in um, 2009. He said this, a spectre is haunting the streets of Copenhagen and walks silently through this room. The spectre is capitalism. Almost nobody wants to mention it. Capitalism, the model of destructive development, is killing people and threatens to put an end to the human species. They are saying in the streets, if the climate were a bank, it would have already been saved. <laughs> or, um, to conclude, as Eva Morales has put it, if you want to save the planet Earth to save life and humanity, 
we are obliged to end the capitalist system. The grave effects of climate change, of the energy, food and financial crises, are not a product of human beings in general, but rather the capitalist system as it is, inhumane with its idea of unlimited industrial development. So that's, I guess, a picture of, of an outline of, of what we're up against. Um, and certainly some of the things I've pointed out today indicate that the future is very grim. Um, and I think the, the only way we can approach this is to acknowledge that and be honest about it. Um, we are not going to make any big changes without being fully aware and conscious of just how bad the alternative is. Uh, at the same time, I think that we have, it's a, it's a bit more hopeful to, to look at the problem or to get to the roots of the problem. Because very rarely throughout history has any big social problem been solved without an awareness of what the problem actually is. <laughs> anyway, hopefully we can uh, develop more of this in discussion and also add in some ideas about some of the practical steps we can take to get just that little bit closer to some of the the, the eco-socialist vision that I, that I mentioned as well. Thank you.